Well, we're very pleased to have Dr. Arun Gandhi here in Fort Wayne uh, at our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace kickoff of the season. Uh, Arun, thank you for coming. It's good it's to have you. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, you have indicated um, that you lived with your grandfather from the ages of 12 to 14, if I remember correctly. Yes. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you remember of him and uh, uh, any, any memories that stick in your mind of Mahatma Gandhi, not the icon, but you know, Mahatma Gandhi, the man. Yeah, he was a very loving grandfather and I was amazed in retrospect now that he was able to spend an hour a day with me in spite of the fact that he was, that was the most busiest period of his life when everything that he had worked for was coming to a, uh, you know, coming to an end there. India was about to get independence and uh, negotiations were going on and so all of these uh, important political events were taking place. He was in the midst of it, he, yet he was able to spend an hour a day with me every day. Hmm. Any other memories that you just remember of him? I mean, what were some of the well, things that you Well, there were lots did? of lessons that he taught me during that period. And, uh, you know, those uh, were kind of lessons that stayed with me for a while. And as I grew up and I began to reflect on them, I realized how important they were and how, uh, what a tremendous message it was. And it gave me a new insight into his philosophy also. This is a very impressionable age for a young man, 12 to 14. Mm -hmm. Can you, I mean, we can probably guess, but uh, can you name one or two of the lessons uh, that he taught you? Well, I think the one and the most important one was about understanding anger and being able to channel that energy positively. And this lesson came about because I grew up in South Africa and I suffered a lot of prejudices there. I was beaten up by whites because they thought I was too black and by blacks because they thought I was too white. And I wanted eye for an eye justice. I wanted to be able to fight back again and defend myself. And uh, that's when my parents took me to India. And so the first lesson that grandfather taught me was about understanding that anger and being able to channel that energy into positive action. He said anger is like electricity. It's just as useful and just as powerful, but only if we use it intelligently. But it can be just as deadly and destructive if we abuse it. So just as we channel electrical energy and bring it into our lives and use it for the good of humanity, we must learn to channel anger in the same way so that we can use that energy for the good of humanity rather than abuse the energy and cause death and destruction. He showed me ways in which uh, to, you know, uh, be able to control anger. One of the ways was to write a journal. So that every time you become angry, don't act on it, don't say anything, but write it down in your journal. But write the journal with the intention of finding a solution to the problem and then commit yourself to finding a solution. Now that is very important because today a lot of people do write an anger journal but because they simply pour their anger out into the journal every time they go back and read it they, they, get, angry. Reminded of, <laughs> yeah. they get angry all over again. So that's not very helpful. But if you write the journal with the intention of finding a solution then you begin to work towards finding a solution and, and that's more constructive. You've uh, probably covered both of these in what you just said, but it strikes me that the channeling of anger, you, you mostly refer to the channeling of your own internal mm -hmm. anger. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I guess that goes a long way in helping to channel the anger of the other directed toward you. Yes, because when you respond to anger with anger, you just multiply the anger. But if you respond to somebody's anger with uh, love and, and understanding, then you know you disarm the person. I imagine that that, and of course, one of the things that your grandfather is known for, probably the master of it is not only interpersonal relationships. I mean, that's difficult enough, mm -hmm. you and me. Mm -hmm. 
but to do it on a among peoples yeah. or on a national scale or an international scale right. that's quite complex and quite difficult it and, is. and yet it seemed very simple I mean the right. way your grandfather practiced it well I think if you can you know sum it up in one sentence I think what he said was um, that I am willing to die but there is no cause for which I am willing to kill and I think that sums up his whole philosophy of nonviolence that he would rather sacrifice his life but then uh, but take a life uh, because of what he believes in and uh, unfortunately today we don't believe in that we want to uh, take other people's lives uh, because they don't agree with us or believe in us and that's where all the violence begins yeah you re you refer to your experiences as a boy in south africa where you were beat mm -hmm. up by blacks because you were too white and vice versa mm -hmm. um, that must have been that must have been so formative in a negative way i mean uh you you learn some things about not fairness and justice, but unfairness and injustice in life. Yeah, and unfortunately it came at a very young age because you grew up in a society that was filled with hate. And it seemed to me as I was growing up there that nobody loved anybody at all. Everybody kind of hated everybody. And mostly because of the color of the skin. So it was a very difficult time and a difficult atmosphere to grow up in. Just say a word. I mean, this is especially true in the West, I imagine, but we're finding it now in the East, too, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And that is that even with all of the things that have been written about nonviolence and even with all the examples we have in our world of the power of nonviolence, nonviolence still seems to be associated with weakness. Can, can you talk a little bit about your understanding of power in nonviolence or s the strength of a nonviolent approach? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And I think the reason for that is that, uh, you know, even scholars who have studied Gandhi's philosophy of nonviolence have only looked at it as a strategy, as yeah. a weapon of convenience. Exactly. And nonviolence is not a <coughs> weapon of convenience. It's not a strategy. You either use it completely or you don't use it at all. It is mostly about personal transformation. If you don't transform yourself, if you don't uh, turn your weaknesses into strengths uh, and then practice nonviolence, you will never be successful. Although it's not a, it's not a, an exact translation. In fact, it's not even a close translation. But you know, satyagraha. So oftentimes you see a soul force. Yeah. And, and I, I'm, I'm not a particular fan of, of that translation. But it does speak to more of what you're saying. This is not just a tactic. No. It is something that fills one's being. This is how you are, not just what you do. Exactly. I, does that make sense? Exactly. I mean, I call it more, more the pursuit of truth. Holding I, fast to truth. Holding, yeah, not holding fast so much because truth is not constant. You know, the belief that the truth is not changing, it's constant, is wrong. Truth changes all the time and we need to change along with it. But if we pursue it in, in uh, all honesty and, and diligence, then uh, at some stage we will be able to understand what the truth is. So we have to accept the fact that truth is ever changing. Nothing remains constant. I want you to say something a little bit more personal now. You and your wife, uh, uh, Sananda, were lifelong partners in your work together. I mean, she was, you were equal partners yeah. from what I've read. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your work together, uh, and, and especially um, your work together to alleviate poverty in, in the villages uh, in, in India. Yeah, well, we, when we got married in 1958, uh, we both decided that uh, we didn't want to pursue materialism. We didn't want to just make money and have a good life, that, that our life m meant more to uh, for to work for others than just for ourselves. 
So we took the decision that one person would work and support the family and the other person would do social work. And because she was a trained nurse uh, and more, uh, uh, you know, nursing was something worth required in the uh, in social work. There. She decided to do the social work and I decided to uh, earn money for the family. And, and that's what we did and we were always partners as you said in, in everything that we did. And uh, as a journalist I was able to help her a lot in her social work because whenever she came uh, came up with a problem or uh, or some difficulties. I was able to go and write about it and and uh, and use the influence of the newspaper to get things done and so on. So it was a good partnership between the two of us. You were married for how many years? Fifty. Fifty. She died in two thousand seven. Two thousand seven, exactly, on the fiftieth wedding anniversary. Oh. You and I talked a little bit earlier about how you first got involved in uh, uh, um, the peace and justice and human rights issues in uh, Israel and Palestine. Uh, you you want to just share that story a little bit with us, please? Yes, I was in uh, San Antonio. I was invited to speak there, and, uh, and there's a group there I didn't know about. It. They call themselves Palestinians for Peace. And one of the things that they do is take a group from here to Palestine to show them what's happening in that country. So they heard me speak there and they wanted to know if, they, if I could join them and I said yes. And so we had a small group of about uh, 10 or 12 people and we went there. And you discovered? I have discovered all the problems of uh, the people there. It was uh, heartbreaking to know that uh, this kind of thing still persists, and uh, and people are so uh, Palestinian people are so uh, subjugated and uh, you know oppressed by the, the Israelis. It was shocking.